All right, everybody, this is Ross. In today's video, we're gonna cover a number of different topics. And um, I've been really enjoying making these videos for you guys in this way, where we cover maybe two to three or four different topics in one episode, one video, gives you guys a nice little glimpse, a lot of information in a short period of time. And then also, I think it gives you guys some nice perspective. and. Um, you get to see kind of what are some of the things that I do on a daily basis or a weekly basis. Um, so in you know this video here, we're going to talk about my tomatoes. And we're going to be training them, whoop, and we're going to be pruning them. And then we're going to turn you guys around because behind you guys are my peaches, and we're going to bag some peaches. And I'm going to talk about why bagging them with some organza bags is a really good idea. And then we're also going to take you guys around the uh, west side of the house and then we're going to pick some red currants. Our red currants are ready. We'll talk about the red currant just in general. Uh, and the reason why we're picking them now is because we're going to make some jam later tonight. So uh, let's start with the tomatoes here. And the tomatoes, I started these, if you guys saw our, maybe you saw our tour videos that we've been doing. We give you guys a nice little glimpse of the garden here. It's looking so good this year. The tomatoes were started from seed. I did not start them uh, indoors and transplant them. I direct seeded them into this raised bed. Because it's raised, it has a lot of soil temperatures. Also, we're on the south side of the house. It gets a lot of sun for most of the day. But I direct seeded them underneath some plastic. We had our low tunnels here set up, not just under the over top of the figs, but they were also over top of these pepper plants these ground cherries, the eggplants, and we direct seeded everything in here. The basil's coming up now. The tomatoes obviously have taken off the most, the quickest, because I planted them first, but also they don't necessarily mind some cooler temperatures, unlike the peppers and the eggplants. So, you know, it's, uh, it's May 1st, I think we direct seeded these. And now we're at Father's Day, June 21st, and they already have fruits on them, plenty of fruits on them and they have a lot of flowers on them. So I think this is a great method. Uh, if something fails, you guys couldn't get your indoor seeding environment right, couldn't get things to germinate all that well, maybe you were busy, um, you can go out and do it like this. Just put some plastic over it. I think I've had amazing success uh, doing it this way. So what we're gonna do here is train them vertically because I like to grow them vertically. I like to have more food in a smaller space. Instead of letting a tomato plant bush out, as an example, you know, this is only a three foot by maybe five foot wide space here. Yeah, that's exactly how wide it is. And in that raised bed, that's 15 square feet, I could maybe have two or three tomato plants. And the amount of tomatoes that I would get off of those tomatoes is pretty small. Um, so if we grow them vertically, I'd actually be able to grow so much more food in a smaller space and uh, it just seems more worth it to me. You know, I wanna have a lot of tomatoes for paste and making sauce. I love the orange banana. I like to have my cherries. I like to have my big beef steaks. So um, in this, instead of having a 15 square feet space, I've widened it just a little bit. And now I'm growing somewhere around 15, um, 19, 23 tomato plants in a very small space. Each one of these poles represents a tomato plant and i have been basically using this green stretch tie here i love this stuff i use it for a lot and i just come in here and wrap these plants single stemmed tomato plants to each of the poles and now each of the poles has a tomato plant which then grows vertically as a single stem now what you have to do is come in here on these plants and take out the suckers you don't want all this growth along these plants because then they're going to bush out and that's not the objective here the objective is to get these plants as single stems so these are where what the suckers look like and they form above the leaf stems uh, where they attach to the main trunk or the main stem of the tomato and then from there they're in that little crotch and you just break them off with your thumb, as an example. So all along these plants, here's one down here, attaches the main stem to where the leaf stem attaches. In between there is a sucker, and you just break these off with your thumb, 
And that's all I do. As, this, as the uh, plants grow, I keep attaching them higher and higher and higher to these poles. Eventually they reach a height that I can't reach them anymore and then they start to come down and cascade and uh, put out the final fruits for me that way at the end of my season. You can see some fruits forming, plenty of flowers, even on the big beef steaks like my pink brandy wine over here, they are just filled with tomatoes and flowers. And they're doing wonderful. I'm so happy, I'm so pleased. We have a lot of tomatoes in here and a much smaller space than I imagined. Here's more suckers. And you just gotta break off these suckers as the plant grows and stay on top of it. And if you do that, you'll have a lot less disease pressure and a lot more yield in a smaller space. I also clean up the bottoms. As the plants grow taller and the trusses of tomatoes form, um, I'll clean up anything below the trusses. If we complete a truss, we harvest the entire cluster of tomatoes. Then I cut off the trusses that are left over and I cut off any of the leaves up to the next truss of tomatoes that is ripening. So it cleans up the bottom, increases airflow, you get better disease resistance. Uh, it's just a better way to grow tomatoes in my climate, without a doubt. So here's my peaches, guys. And uh, try to get you guys straight here. <laughs> They're on a bit of an angle. I don't know if, there we go. That's pretty decent. So we're gonna bag the peaches now. And the peaches, um, they just kind of like to be eaten by squirrels and groundhogs and things like to really nibble on these things. I'm gonna break one off here because I have some that are a bit lower down on the plant. And I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. That some of these critters, I guess even rabbits, I know a lot of, oh, a lot of animals in the area and we've got it all. Like this is a pit that I just pulled off. This is an entire pit because you get the peach and they start nibbling around the pit and eventually it just turns into a pit. And you know, I'd rather not have birds or other things attacking my peaches. When these guys turn right, then a lot more is gonna be attacking them and a lot more frequently. So this is kind of, I think, when they start going after the unripe peaches, this is kind of their last resort. They don't really have any other food, it seems like, and this is like just a little bit of something that they can get. Um, so for me, I'd rather not have them do that because on these two peaches here, I actually have a pretty limited crop this year. So I'm trying to protect all the peaches I can, and that's where these bags come in, the organza bags. I use these for so many purposes, so many different fruits. You can bag a cluster of grapes, you can bag peaches, you can bag your apples. So I've gone around the yard in the last couple days, not just the peaches, but I've bagged just about everything I can. Any plums that we have that are left over, um, any of the pears that we have that'll ripen later, the apples, the stone fruits, any of the stone fruits, the figs as they ripen, I bag them with the organza bags. And what's nice about these, is you just pull the string and it tightens the top and then the fruit sits in the bag and again not nothing can get in the bag eventually i think the squirrels learn some of the cat birds that are very vicious birds can actually break through the bag and they'll eventually do that to a lot of them but luckily um, this does delay them this does stop them in their tracks and you're able to protect your fruit this way um, and if you don't have a ton of fruit, this is a really great method, I find, if you can bag all of your fruits. You know, you got nets, you got scarecrows, different things that you can use um, to really protect these things. But, you know, at the end of the day, this is tough to beat. Um, and they're really affordable. I have them on my Amazon storefront, guys. There's a link on Amazon in the description. I'll bring it to the storefront. You can see exactly what organza bags that I have purchased in the exact size and uh, helps me out a little bit. So that's what I've been doing the last couple of days is coming through here and bagging all these unripe fruits. Uh, and then of course, like I said, when they do ripen, this one's actually, these are actually purple. I don't think the color really matters all that much, guys. 
But, you know, like I said, once the, uh, the fruits are ripened, or close to being ripe, that's when everything really starts to go after these. And it's better to have this protected now, um, I think, than never. You know, it's really good if you can keep your pests, insects, critters, different things, if they don't necessarily know it's there, it will never really become an issue. If you wait until the birds and all the other animals recognize that, oh, there's peaches here and they're ripe, everything's going to start coming after these. And uh, by that point, they'll always know it's here for the entire season. So if you can keep them away from the very, very beginning, you're going you're gonna to see much better results with protecting your, your different crops. So let's bring you guys over now to the currants, the red currants. You can see here some bagged peaches that we did. And also my apples are bagged. You can see the blue are bags and the white bags. We even have over here, we bagged all of our grape clusters with uh, wax paper bags. And those are for disease. We did a separate video on that there, guys. Gotta protect them from the black rot. Now the red currants, um, is a fruit that I find is really reliable here. I'm gonna grab my basket. They just honestly produce every single year without fail. The birds love them, they're red, they ripen early, so it's hard to keep them off. So what I do is I net them. You can see the net here, I took off the net. And what I don't like about using bird nets on particular fruiting plants is that it rips off a lot of the berries and you see a lot of berries over here on the ground after trying to take off the net. So you lose some fruit. It seems like it's inevitable, but the production on these is insane. Um, I mean, look at that. That's just uh, crazy. The red currants, as I said, just are insanely, insanely productive. It's tough to really even tell unless you get underneath the skirt of the plant. But they're there, and I'll show it to you guys as I harvest. Because as I said, what we're gonna do, we harvest all these guys at once. Now that they're all red, and then we make our jam. And they sort of all nicely ripen all at once for me, which is really nice. The way you harvest them, is very simple. You come in here and you pull off the entire cluster of fruits that attaches to the bush. So there you have it. There's the entire cluster. And this is what is attached to the bush. You pull this off. And what's even nicer, by the way, is that you can come in here and you can put this whole thing in your mouth if you wanted to eat them. And slide them off. There you go. So not only will I be harvesting these like this, but when I take them off, I basically just slide them off with my hands and put them down here in the basket. You know what I mean? So it's a nice way to, to I think, uh, make this process a lot easier is to come in here and eat them like that or pull them off like that. Now they're pretty good and they say that the red currant makes the best jam. So we're gonna really try hard this year to replicate those results that people have with the red currant. And I think a lot of it has to do with getting very ripe fruits. They gotta be ripe. Uh, and then also we're gonna need to strain out a lot of the seeds. They're very seedy plants. And a lot of that never really breaks down in the cooking process when we create our jam. So it's really important here, I think, to take a little bit of extra steps in this to get the right product that everybody's been bragging about for, uh, for a long time, you know? So that's it. That is the video here, guys. Is that We're going to harvest all these red currants. It's going to take me quite a bit. And I'll show you if you're not really convinced at how productive these plants can be. Look at that bush right there.
just absolutely loaded with red fruits. So anyway guys, thank you so much here for watching this video. I really appreciate you guys sticking in here, getting to the end. Please give this one a thumbs up and subscribe. See everybody soon, all right? Take care, stay safe out there.